The world is running out of clean water. Explosive population growth and increasingly erratic weather patterns have caused tremendous water scarcity in communities all around the globe. With freshwater demand projected to increase dramatically over the next several decades, the future of international water security is heading in a grim direction. Historically, these issues have been mostly self-contained, but with greater global interconnectedness, the potential for conflict has become almost inevitable, and in certain regions has already begun. Welcome to the Era of Hydropolitics. Let's first take our focus to the Colorado River in the southwestern United States. While open conflict is far less likely, the ways in which this dispute is approached will serve as a model for future political discussions over the question of water rights. In August of 2021, the American federal government declared the first ever water shortage on the Colorado River, essentially calling for mandatory water cuts in several surrounding states that would persist over the following years. This was sparked after water levels in Lake Mead were projected to drop below the minimum energy requirements of the region. This should not be overlooked as overuse of the river system jeopardizes the reliable supply of water for a population of approximately 40 million. The Colorado River Basin is also a primary source of irrigation for both farm and rangeland, stretching across 5.5 million acres of land. The current allocation of water is based on a near-century-old pact that will expire in 2026. Much of the current issues stem from the fact that the initial estimates were based upon a series of especially wet years, meaning those early figures far exceed the amount of water that the river can actually provide on an annual basis. Negotiations have already commenced to determine how best to divide the water amongst participating groups, including Native American tribes, American states, and Mexico. One of the main challenges negotiators face is how best to handle the allocation of water when 70% of it is used in agriculture. As water cuts begin to take effect, hikes in the prices of consumer goods are an inevitable consequence. With so many conflicting interests at stake, only time will tell how this complex issue is resolved. Next, let's shift our focus to the Nile. Spanning 11 different countries and 280 million people, the Nile River has been an essential source of irrigation for more than 5,000 years. Recently, tensions have risen after Ethiopia began the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This $5 billion hydropower project will be the largest on the African continent, creating a reservoir of approximately 74 billion cubic meters. Now for scale, this is more than twice the operational capacity of Lake Mead on the Colorado River. Typically, these types of infrastructure projects generate little international attention. However, the multi-year filling process will create water diversions that have the potential to devastate downstream water-dependent countries like Egypt and Sudan. In response to criticism of the environmental and humanitarian impact, Ethiopian officials have argued that it's well within their rights to utilize their natural resources to combat poverty and improve the living conditions of their people, given that only around half the population has access to electricity. According to the University of Southern California, the rapid filling of the dam could reduce water supplies downstream by more than one-third. This has immense ramifications on Egypt's economy, employment, and food supply, as it relies on the Nile for approximately 90% of its water usage. To make matters worse, the region's population is projected to increase 25% over the next 30 years, making the potential for conflict all the more likely. It is not an overstatement to affirm that for Egypt, the GERD is an existential threat. While both parties seek a mutually beneficial international solution, negotiations have yielded few results and Ethiopia has continued filling with no deal in place. The potential for a peaceful resolution can still be achieved, but such a goal will be difficult to attain given all that's at stake, namely regional power, national pride, and economic development. Finally, let's examine the Tibetan Plateau. This geopolitical hotspot is home to vast reserves of fresh water that supply as many as nine countries in the surrounding region. By claiming ownership over Tibet's natural resources, China wields immense control over an estimated annual output of 718 billion cubic meters of water that flows into neighboring countries including India, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. With heightened tensions and recent skirmishes along the Sino-Indian border, the fact that nearly 50% of this water flows directly into India grants China an effective chokehold on its economy. 
In recent years, China has begun the rerouting of various tributaries and the construction of ambitious hydropower projects along the Brahmaputra River, a source of life for over 130 million people. Despite Chinese assurance that such projects would pose no threat to downstream neighbors, Indian officials have highlighted the dangers of such dams, including the potential to divert water during annual dry seasons or release the water suddenly during the monsoon months to allow flash flooding. Either way, India finds itself in a precarious situation. If we remember back to 2017, both Indian and Chinese armed forces engaged in a border standoff over the Chinese construction of a road in the disputed territory of Daklam. After a tense 73 days, both countries announced a withdrawal of troops, but little was mentioned of the reports that China had withheld hydrological data on the nearby rivers, resulting in floods in Assam and Uttar Pradesh states. Because of this lack of a mutually agreed upon method of settling water sharing disputes for transboundary rivers, India is left with few diplomatic options. One proposed course of action is the establishment of a coalition of South Asian countries facing similar predicaments, so as to collectively impose economic sanctions on any upstream violators. Ultimately, the ability of these nations to manage resource-driven escalations and prevent all-out conflict is dependent on the ability of their leaders to avoid antagonistic policies and to be willing to engage in productive dialogue. This is easier said than done.